Good morning, everybody. This is Man Coverage with Knoxville Nate and James P. Bonneville coming to you live on Sunday, October 1st. Week five of college football going down. We had some more pretty interesting football games that we are going to break down for you today. We have a special guest. We have a live uh, broadcast coming to you from Colorado Springs, Colorado, after James hit up the Air Force Academy's game last night uh, to do a little live scouting. Uh, we're going to break that down. James, how are you doing over there in the forest? You look I'm uh, I'm tired. I'm not going to lie. I'm tired, but it's beautiful as all get out out here. It's no doubt about it. It's a lot of fun. I can tell you that. You look like uh, the the smoky bear that tells you not to start forest fires. I keep waiting for you to I keep waiting for you to hold up a sign and be like, "Put your fires out." Uh, <laughs> lots of redwoods back there. Oh, uh, it's we, yeah, it's it's awesome out here. That's gorgeous, dude. And um, you know we. Nobody's talking about it, but uh, another another good game from the Falcons. So we are going to talk about it today, um, as we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about some teams that maybe are a little bit overrated, and some teams that are underrated. So so think about that, James. I want to have you. I'm going to throw some names at you, and I want you to tell me uh, whether you think they're they're overrated as they stand right now or underrated. Yeah, uh, based on based on your opinions. Uh, obviously, people are going to have different opinions, but I want yours. So we're going to break that down. Uh, we're going to talk about all the games, and then we've got a special guest who we're going to bring on today as well. So full, full show uh, here on Man Coverage. This is why I love college football, man. I mean, it's it's so fun to watch. Um, there's so many amazing games every week, and I think we got to start, I guess, with uh, with the Irish. You know, I, I was yeah. kind of expecting a little bit of a letdown, uh, potentially, after that hard-fought. Uh, Ohio State game, which which I will admit could have could have really gone either way, and then they went you know down into the belly of the beast it, where Durham somehow has turned into a tough place to play, and yeah. uh, you know, it was a good, well coached football team there with Duke and obviously uh, you know a good quarterback and Notre Dame you know started off strong was I believe up fourteen to nothing. And uh, and then or thirteen is it thirteen nothing thirteen nothing yeah thirteen nothing excuse me and uh, you know then then Duke mounted their comeback uh, wasn't didn't end up being enough but I gotta admit I was impressed by both of these football teams Notre Dame walked away with the victory twenty one fourteen James what did you think about uh, this this kind of ACC showdown well I, I look at my Galco's teams and they just have a different identity. Um, I mean, they were down 13 nothing. I mean, heck, in the third quarter. And y- you never used to see that kind of um, pushback where they're not going to lay down. Prior teams would have laid down and just, you know, gone away. And this Duke team, just getting back into the game, having to lead late, I mean, it just shows what, in the small time Mike Elko was at, is at Duke so far, he has really transformed the culture of of the Blue Devils as a whole. I mean, how, I mean, when in your lifetime have you ever said going to Wallace Wade Stadium was going to be a tough out? I mean, it was one of those uh, stadiums people hated to go to because, heck, the visitors' locker room didn't even have air conditioning. Yeah, not only that, but they, you know, it never really used to be filled up. I mean, they now, would even when even some years where they had some decent teams and played, you know, semi uh, good football, they would have trouble uh, getting yeah. people to go. Um, yeah. And let's let's be honest. Duke is a uh, basketball school. It still is a basketball school. However, uh, this guy is the real deal in coaching. I, I my question to you, and we're going to break down this game here in just a second. But my 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 question to you is: Let's say this year uh, ends up. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with the quarterback because he got banged up on the at the end of the game. Uh, so that could really affect the outcome. But I, I know people are taking notice of this. Uh, how long do you think this guy stays at Duke? Uh, do you think he continues to to be there and build this thing, or do you think he uh, goes for greener pastures? Well, I mean, honestly, I, his name is already being floated out there for the uh, open wash uh, Michigan State job, and everybody right. else has a connection to that school. He doesn't. Um, he is going to be the flashy name, kind of like Lance Leopold was last year. I, I I don't know. I mean, quite frankly, I think this ACC TV contract is not helping matters because 
Duke is not going to have the money to play with the SEC schools or the Big Ten schools. But at the same time, I think he can be a little picky and choosy too as well if he does want to leave. I mean, there is a thing of staying and building some, you know, continuing building something you've already started. You know, it's trying to rebuild every single time doesn't work. Does the team bind your culture? Do you nail that recruiting class? I mean, it honestly, I I think there's certain jobs like if AM came open, I would guess Mike Elko is gone. But right now, if, if which job? Texas A&M. Texas A&M. Because he, he yeah. had that connection to them in the past. But yeah. I, 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 I mean, I, I, it all depends which jobs I, I think are coming open right now. And I don't think we got a really good idea quite yet which jobs they are. No, no. I just meant uh, if something good becomes available, he gets it offered to him. You know, do you think he? Do you think he goes or not? So that's kind of what I, I was getting at. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, we'll, we'll see. It depends. I, I agree with you. I think it depends what job. Uh, I yeah. think it depends how their season ends. Um, all all those things are going to play in. But this guy's proven to be a, an amazing coach, in my opinion, uh, just the way he's won uh, at Duke, the way that this team plays. I mean, they, they're just not an easy out anymore. This no. team uh, puts up a fight no matter who it is. Uh, Clemson comes to town. Notre Dame comes to town. It doesn't really matter. Uh, who it is? They're they're going to put up a pretty damn good fight, and uh, I like watching this team play. They're they're gritty. Uh, they play good hard nosed defense. Um, you know, I, I like this this quarterback. Uh, he's more of he kind of was more of a running uh, quarterback here against Notre Dame uh, with his 18 carries for 88 yards, almost five yards a pop. But uh, pretty impressive. I, I have to give credit to to Notre Dame and to the Irish. Uh, like I said, I, I thought there might be a little bit of a letdown after the Ohio State game, but they played tough. Uh, they even when no, uh, Duke popped them in the mouth in the second half and started to come back, uh, you know they 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 did that. They had a kind of a signature drive there uh, where they uh, showed up and they had some guys missing. Uh, they had a couple of wide receivers out and um, you know a couple of injuries they were dealing with, and still uh, they came back and, and won this game. So. Uh, kudos to Coach Freeman and and, and the Irish uh, for getting it done. But uh, I want to move on to a game that I believe was Friday night. Um, yes. A very interesting uh, game out west. Uh, last week we talked about our sleeper teams. I had Duke as one of them. Uh, they lost. Then I had Utah as one of them, and they lost. But I've got to uh, give myself a little bit of backing here because I, I thought that Cam Rising might play again. And, uh, you know, we keep we keep hearing, oh, he's he may be ready this week. Oh, he may be ready next week. But yet here we are uh, entering week six and we still have yet to see him. And uh, it, it started it, it finally caught up to them as they lost uh, to Oregon State 21 seven on Friday night. Um, th- this is a big, big loss for Utah, in my opinion, because yeah. they were they were playing pretty well, even though he wasn't there. Um but, you know, this was more than just missing Cam Rising. I mean, uh, Nate Johnson, 8 of, eight of 23, that, that wasn't good. Uh, they even QBR got... under 10, you're in trouble. You yeah, know? That's, that's not good. When you complete eight passes all day and you're not playing for a service academy, yeah, uh, that's not a good thing. And, and, and DJU, uh, you know, continues to, to be a winner and uh, not the greatest numbers ever, but still a pretty good performance. I'm pretty impressed. Uh, with the way that Oregon State bounced back. What did you think of this game, uh, 21-7 victory for Oregon State over Utah? I, I think Oregon State's, their game plan going into this game was defensively was amazing. Just keep putting pressure on the quarterback over and over and over. I mean, you know how, what I feel about Jonathan Smith. I, I, I think he is, I mean, as good a job as what Mike Elko has done at Duke. I think Jonathan Smith has done a greater job resurrecting the Oregon State Beavers. And the timing couldn't be more perfect uh, with everything going down in the Pac-12 or yeah. now the Tupac. I mean, it, it, it's – people, I think, were a little down on them if they lost last week. But, I mean, hell, they put up 35 and lost to Washington State. That's nothing to sneeze about. Washington State's a quality program, but – Man, it was blitz after blitz, and they changed those. I mean, the blitz packages were looking different every single time. I mean, it was Johnson and Barnes were just back there just getting killed. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, a very a very interesting uh, game. 
that I uh, that I got to watch. And, um, you know, I got to be honest, I, I was listening to, you know, your boys, Barrett Salee again this morning, and they both said him and Tom uh, Lugan Booger uh, both were saying that they had predicted that the um, the Pac Tupac was going to be the best conference this year. I was like, man, I must have missed that show. I must have uh, too. I never yeah. heard them say that once, but they both yeah. they both said that they somebody called in and was like, can you believe how good you know the Pac two is and how amazing uh, the Pac two is this year and and how they're getting it done and they're like, oh, we're not surprised. We knew this. We called this. I was like, no, you didn't. I listen to the show all the time. Uh, that's a outright lie. And yeah. I, I didn't I didn't call it either. I mean, I, I we, we talked about how we we were impressed with the coaches uh, that have gone in uh, to the uh, Pac-12 and, and Chip Kelly taking over at uh, UCLA. Obviously, we've mentioned also Jonathan Smith at Oregon State, uh, the coaching jobs at Utah, you know, just keeps getting better. Um, you know, all, all these teams, obviously. Uh, we've been impressed with at different times, but to have them all kind of hit together at once, uh, nobody predicted it. Uh, nobody predicted it, and those guys definitely did not. So uh, well, they can take credit for it. But you look at the conference from top to bottom. I mean, yeah, are there some bottom dweller teams? Yeah, but I mean, there's. I mean, teams are not talking about as much. Colorado is light years better than it was last year. Cal's offense looks like it has a pulse. I mean, usually putting up 20 points at Cal was like an act of Congress. Now it's after Jake Spevitol comes in there, you know, they've, they've, they've had a 50 point offensive game, which is freaking shocking for Cal. I mean, Arizona state with all their troubles, they are playing, I think ahead of schedule. So, I mean, this conference as a whole is really upgraded. I agree. Arizona state is a surprise. I did not expect them to have a a big season after what all went down uh, with your boy uh, uh, from the Jets, who kind of ran that program into the ground out there, oh. <laughs> and uh, I like her, uh, but I, I mean, I, some of the, the the recruiting stuff was like, where was their administration? And all that. I mean, seriously. Well, it's so weird. Like well, you're Herm Edwards, man. I mean, you you're on yeah. TV. You're on TV for ten years. You coach the Jets. Like this guy was a a big time NFL player. Like you didn't need to cheat. Uh, guys were going to come yeah. there. Uh, for you and the staff that he had, he had a pretty impressive uh, staff with uh, you know a couple of former players and uh, a couple of respected coaches. I, I didn't really understand that. That was kind of weird. But let's stay uh, out in the uh, Pac-12 right now because there was another game uh, that wasn't really supposed to be this close, uh, but you know still was a hyped up game because of all the hoopla uh, surrounding Colorado. And uh, obviously Caleb Williams coming in, Gus Johnson and Joel uh, Flatclat. Uh, we're giving Caleb Williams the Heisman uh, in the third quarter. They're like, uh, you know, he he had a public cry to uh, viewers and voters that if you uh, you know wouldn't vote for Caleb Williams just because he won the year before, that you're wrong and that you need to vote for him. And then Colorado almost came back and won. So yeah. how about watching the damn game that you're doing? And maybe let it end before you start handing freaking awards out. Uh, Piss me off because, you know, he's sitting there talking about how great Caleb Williams is, which he is good. Not saying he's not, but you got to give credit to Colorado after a, a rough week, missing Shiloh Sanders, missing Travis Hunter, and they damn near came back and won this game. What did you think about Colorado's effort? Uh, against USC and what what does this say about the Trojans uh, moving forward well I think this says a lot about about coach prime and how he's building this team I mean you look at last week against Oregon and Oregon's very physical at the point of contact uh, at at the line of scrimmage and it I I was my thought process I mean because let's be honest they really got beat down hard yes would you see that same kind of mindset when USC got up on, on them this time? And they didn't. I mean, freaking, I mean, the comeback alone. I mean, ESPN running about USC struggles to win. You score 48 to 41 against a good team. The thing that really hit me was that receiver, that uh, Omarion Will, uh, Miller from Louisiana. Yep. Freshman. Oh, wow. I mean, not only was Coach Prime holding him out for academic reasons, but look what he did coming into the situation. Like first game he's played, seven catches, one ninety six. His great speed, great change of direction. I, I'm, I was really impressed. Like I see this team really maturing from game to game. They look 
more the part of that. And I think, honestly, they should be ranked again. I do, too. I do, too. If you're going to rank USC that high, then you need to yeah. uh, give Colorado the credit. And uh, I, you got to give, you know, I know people are giving prime credit. Obviously they talk about him all the time, but you have to, I mean, this is a one in 11 team last year that, that had no pulse. And yeah. this year, you know, they had a really good shot if they could have gotten the ball. I mean, they scored 14 points in the fourth quarter uh, to cut the lead to seven. And, um, you know, I give, I give Shadur a lot of credit too, because some people were, you know, talking about him after that Oregon game, like maybe you should worry more about the games than your cars and, you know, just some, some bull crap that, uh, you know, he didn't really deserve considering how he's played. I mean, yeah, uh, he got roughed up in that, um, Oregon game, but the whole team did that. That wasn't really just him. And he comes back and throws four touchdowns also ran, uh, a, a long 25 yard touchdown, uh, to kind of get the scoring going for the buffs. Uh, was very impressed with Colorado and their performance. I know they lost, uh, but that was more, I think this game was more about Colorado than it was USC. That's, I mean, that's why I kept seeing the highlights come across. I mean, the headlines come across and I'm like, man, that was a better game. They made it sound like it was just like USC stumbled into a win. I mean, Colorado is, there's a mindset this team has. They know they're better than before and they're, they're going bowling this year. I mean, just oh, yeah. mark it, mark it down. They're going bowling, which I agree. I mean, that alone should give, in my opinion, coach prime, the freaking uh, coach back 12 coach of the year minimum. Yeah, I, I already I, – we said this yeah. months ago. I said if he wins six games, he is the coach of the year, and uh, they're going to win six games the way they're playing. And uh, I'm worried about uh, the Trojans uh, with the uh, the way that their defense is playing. That secondary is hot garbage. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. There was guys just running down the field wide open. I, 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 kudos to the, to the freshman kid. But should a freshman who's playing in his first game in Power 5 football be allowed to just run free – uh, you know, I mean, he's got speed, he's got the skills, but still, uh, somebody should have been behind him, especially after about the third catch, uh, where he's running free down the sideline. So, uh, I, 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 USC, USC is going to lose a game this year or two. Yeah, I like, agree. I mean, I, I, honestly, if you, I think they're going to lose to Notre Dame. I mean, I, just I, not, I do too. I think Notre out. Dame's, I think Notre Dame is more physical than them yeah. on, on offensive, uh, line and defensive lines. Uh, I think. I think Notre Dame definitely has a good shot of beating them uh, if they can slow Caleb Williams down, which which is easier uh, said than done. But don't you have to beat somebody good before you get the Heisman? Don't you have to win something? Don't you have to do – I mean, I thought that was the whole point of the Heisman is the best player in college football, not the guy that racks up the most stats in meaningless Pac-12 games, which is well, what I, this guy I, does. I, I mean, you don't, you don't win Heisman since September, but you can lose them. Correct. And it, we, I mean, how I go back to the Kyler Murray Heisman year, no one was putting talking about Kyler Murray until November. And he it's not like his game changed that much. It's just the exposure changed that much. And quite frankly, I don't think we've got that team out there, that guy out there who's really cutting it through because everybody is so focused on. The, you know, the Pac-12 explosion and all this. I mean, do I still think Caleb Williams is a pretty good chance? Yeah, but he's got to he's got to come to play in November. His, I mean, yeah. stats are better, but th this game isn't about stats. You know, otherwise, why play the games? Yeah, that's that's why he that's all he kept talking about during the broadcast was always oh, stats yeah. are better this year. His stats are better this year. Well, you know, his stats were good last year, but he lost to Utah twice. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter how many yards you throw for if you can't beat the Utes. Uh, and that, that to me, that kind of rings true this year as well. Uh, and, and another guy who, um, you know, I guess has a shot at it, but uh, w whether or not he's ready to go, I'm not sure. Uh, I certainly think this game was won more because of Jonathan Brooks than Quinn Ewers, but Texas holds serve, uh, you know, missing their quarterback, I think killed Kansas in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, the backup Jason Bean filling in for Daniels, nine of 21 for 136 yards. Uh, didn't have the nine uh, QBR, but 17.2 isn't real good either. Uh, what did you think about Texas taking care of business 40 14 over Kansas? I, 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 this was an impressive win for the Longhorns. Sorry, Eric. the uh, place we're staying at, the dog next door wants to play catch with me while I'm doing the show. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is <laughs> the fun of doing a show outside. I was impressed that 
we haven't seen Texas pull a Texas in some time where they go into a game and this is the game that Texas is finally back and they go out there and lay the big egg. And Mm -hmm. this, I, I, I was impressed how they came out inflicted their will and made the game their own. I mean, Kansas is a darling right now and they really held them down quite a bit. Yeah, they did. Uh, they kind of dominated this game, um, you know, from start to finish, jumped up 10, nothing and uh, never really, never really took their, their foot off the gas. And, and to be able to run uh, the football like that, 20, uh, Jonathan Brooks, 21 carries, 218 yeah. yards. This team ran for over 335 yards in this game and ran for four touchdowns. That to me was what I took away most. Um, from the Texas victory, 336 on the ground, four touchdowns. Uh, that to me was pretty impressive. I mean, when Sarkeesian came into Austin, there was a realistic problem with that offensive line. There just wasn't that toughness that they once had. And that was the first thing he worked on. And they look considerably better. I mean, they're, they were winning recruiting battles that they would lose in the past in the line of scrimmage. And it shows. I mean, 336 on the ground, like you said, 66 six, six average. Per yeah, carry. I mean, you're not you're you're sitting in very few third and long situations. You're probably sitting third and one at worst, if not getting the first down. So, I mean, the, the, you're going to see the naysayers. Well, Jaden Daniels didn't play. Jason Beam is a very good quarterback and got quite a bit of playing time last year. I mean, he did win games for him last year. But yeah, I, I was just saying that you know Daniels can can do things that he can't. That's yes. all I meant. I mean, yes. he is yeah, the guy. Yeah. We saw that game last year. Um, you know, I, I forgetting who they were playing that they went into like four or five overtimes, and it was just like Daniels willing Kansas yeah. to to try and win, and that that's something he can do that this guy can't. But I'm not saying that's the reason they lost. Um, that's the reason maybe that it wasn't closer, but that's not the reason that they lost. Texas dominated them up front. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Honestly, I, I look at Texas' schedule on the way out, and it's it's pretty – I mean, they're going to talk about Red River rivalry, but honestly, I look at their schedule, and I think their hardest game is the last one of the year. Or I think they take that back when they play Kansas State on the 4th of November. But the rest of their schedule is really not that tough. They play all the right games at home. They've got the easiest um... – Probably the easiest route of any of these contenders, in my opinion. Well, Georgia. Uh, the rest of the way. Well, yeah, but Georgia <laughs> seems to struggle with everybody uh, right now. So I'm not sure. And and they have to play Tennessee, and and they'll have to play the SEC championship game. So I, I would much rather be Texas uh, than Georgia right now. Yeah. You agree? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He, it, it's The Georgia game was just like, what the hell? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was privately hoping Georgia would lose because yeah, I think you're not the only one there, bud. I, I just don't. I, I, they're they're getting their ranking based on reputation from the past. Well, that's well, what I, that's what I wanted to ask you about. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to ask you about that because every season we always hear you know preseason rankings, all that crap that everyone says. You know, last year um, doesn't matter. And last year shouldn't count towards this year. That's a lie because if last year didn't count, uh, then Georgia wouldn't be ranked number one. I mean, that's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, I, it, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be because they haven't lost in in three years. So yeah. you know, you got to take that into account. But I'm saying lots of times people say we're not going to take that into account. We're just looking at this year only. Well, that's BS uh, because if you were just looking at this year only they wouldn't be ranked number one. They're ranked number one because they've won 30-something games in a row. Don't you agree? Well, I mean, hell, look at Miami. At preseason, they always get overranked because there's this they, – they they got this belief that Ed Reed, Michael Irvin, and uh, uh, Alonzo Highsmith and the Blades brothers are going to come walking out of the freaking locker room. And they're not. I mean, are they better than what they once were? Yeah. But this isn't Miami of Jimmy Johnson and Larry Coker and and Dennis Erickson. This is a different uh, time period. We got to look at it from year to year rather than looking at, well, they were good once. We really hope they can come back. Let's overrank them again. I mean, heck, I mean, Old Mission have been ranked last week when they got curb stomped by freaking Alabama. 
now they're going to get ranked again because they beat an LSU team that, let's guess what, not that good. Yeah. Um, in fact, they said they were still ranked 20th, which kind of surprised me, but apparently they were. I guess just because there are, aren't are that many good SEC teams, so they got to find somebody uh, to quota. put in the rankings. There's a, and there's a yeah. quota. There's definitely a quota, and uh, Ole Miss uh, filled their quota. But I will give them some credit. Uh, after a rough game against Bama, they they – they could have folded in this game, um, you know, pretty easily, and uh, wouldn't have wouldn't have shocked me. I mean, LSU was up pretty big in the third quarter, and then you know, Ole Miss came back and, and dropped twenty one points in the fourth. Uh, pretty impressed with Jackson Dart, twenty six to thirty nine for three eighty nine, four touchdowns, no picks, and uh, we finally got to see uh, Judkins uh, come out of uh, come out of his uh, slumber and yeah. uh, showed up thirty three carries, one hundred seventy seven yards, and a touch. Uh, we've been waiting for that, and, and finally they found a way to get him rolling. Uh, but pretty impressive win to me. Um, I know LSU might not be quite as good as, as people were making him out to be, but still a pretty impressive win for for Ole Miss. Uh, this pretty much ends uh, the LSU uh, college football playoff talk. Finally, don't you think? I don't know how it started. <laughs> I mean, Grant, uh, they played way above their heads, but. I mean, when I kept seeing these rankings in the top 10, I'm like, how? Like, their running game is questionable. Their passing game is predictable. And their defense isn't what it once was. Unless there's a different team in their locker room, I, I don't know. I mean, it, does Odell Beckham Jr. still have some eligibility left? I mean, uh, not, I, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I, I told you before that. I wasn't that impressed with their skill guys. This was the best game uh, that they've played in a long time uh, from an offensive perspective. I mean, yeah. 49 points. I can't remember the last time they did this. They had two guys uh, go over 100 yards and Brian Thomas Jr. and also neighbors uh, both went over 100 yards receiving. And then they had two guys that were that were right there at 100 yards rushing, if you include the quarterback. So pretty good offensive output, but still. Uh, as Brian Kelly mentioned, you know he he thought they were still a year away, and and I ag I agreed with him. No one yeah, else, I agree. no one at S no one at SEC SECPN agreed with him, but I I did. Yeah, I, I I do too. I mean, how can you have that much turnover and not have some hiccups along the way? You know, it, it's it, it's it's not plug and play. That's for damn sure. Nope. Um... We got to talk real quick. We're going to get to this Air Force game next, but I just wanted to uh, throw out one more time. Uh, pretty sure Jalen Milrow won again. I don't know if you saw uh, yeah. the results, but he won uh, again as the starter uh, for Alabama. Put up 40 points against a not great uh, Mississippi State team, but still, uh, he was he's Bama's whole offense. So yeah. uh, I hope I hope the I hope the quarterback. Uh, controversy is is squashed in Tuscaloosa, don't you? Uh, I think it is. I mean, how uh, other than the pulling of uh, Jalen Hurts for Tua, have you ever seen Saban do that? Like that? that no, no. I, 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 I I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I was kind of shocked when after you know one one not great game. And one loss, he goes and pulls the guy that he had chosen as yeah. the starter, and then replaces him with two clowns. Uh, I, I was I was actually very very shocked by that, and, and still am. Yeah, I, I, it, it's very untypical of him to do that. But I mean, Milrow looked much more confident. Like you could tell, this was a fifth game of the year. He had much more confident in the uh, in the pocket. I mean, he is who he is, but I almost felt like he was doing that uh, just for the fans. I almost yeah. feel like it, there's no way that Nick Saban went out to that practice field and was like, oh, Tyler Buckner gives us the best chance to win. Unless right? he, unless Nick Saban was really drunk that day or <laughs> maybe Tommy Reese was really like, give my kid a chance. You know, it, I I. I Tyler Buckner to Alabama still is one of those that just kind of like I scratch my head. I'm like, what are you doing? You just, yeah, this is this is maybe a time you may want to hang it up because it just isn't there. 
But yeah, you you weren't going to start at Notre Dame, and you, I didn't think he was going to start at at Bama either. I he he ended up getting one, but that that was uh, I'm still scratching my head about it. Uh, let's talk about the game that you were at, um, yeah, and, and the spot that you still are. Uh, this is a team that is now five and zero, three and zero in the Mountain West Conference. I'm talking about the Falcons uh, there at Air Force. Um, you know, you you we, we they put up 49 points and I was kind of talking about the offense and you're like, hold your roll there, buddy. Uh, I was more impressed with the defense. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the victory uh, for Air Force over San Diego State and, and you know, how good how good are the Falcons in your estimation? I, I, they're 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 for real. I mean, they're like, I mean, hell, first off, they're an academy program, which, you know, the discipline's going to be there because hell it's part of the tradition that they have at uh, in Colorado Springs and Annapolis and West Point. Um, but I, I, I'm really impressed with this defense, like literally no first downs until right at the end when, you know, San Diego State's trying just to push something off. It, it, they just they so disciplined and don't catch on bad breaks. You know, they don't you know, they don't make the stupid mistake of doing going for the big hit. It's all about keeping everything in front of them and their safeties. Man, this safety group is a very good group that people are not talking about it. And I could see Trey Taylor, um, one of their star, their bellwether on that safety crew getting drafted um, in this upcoming draft. Um, do, is he going to get the uh, the amount of hype with the fans going into it? No. I mean, probably, you know, if he gets invited to the Senior Bowl or the Combine, which I fully expect is going to happen. Um, but this is a guy who really understands good breaks and reads quarterbacks exceedingly well. I mean, because I can't think this safety class, uh, 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 draft class, I can't, I don't think it's going to be that great as a whole. I think it's going to be very very not not deep at all so yeah, i agree and um you know this is a team in, in air force that nobody's really talking about but uh yeah 49 10 they seem to have found uh you know another one they they've had some great quarterbacks through the years you know bo morgan d dallas all the guys uh that you can think about back through the years and, and it looks like they found another guy i mean six of seven yesterday yeah. Uh, 189 yards, two touchdowns, and and then also you know ran for over 100 yards. Seems to be one of those uh, guys that can kind of spark the offense, uh, which they kind of had in the past. Yeah, I mean it. it, it yeah. The patience they have in waiting, getting that uh, corner set, uh, and, and just owning the having uh, having the uh, outside really helps them. I mean, they're just so disciplined, their blocking schemes. And once they get outside, if you don't contain the, contain the edge, they're going to wrap up some yards on you. I agree. Um, well, we'll, before we, we're going to bring on our guests in just one second, before we do, I want to, um, talk to you just one second. I'm going to throw out some, some team names to you. And I want you to tell me, uh, whether or not this team is overrated or underrated. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and just what first thing that pops in your mind? Uh, what do you what do you think about this team as far as you know their ranking and their chances of making the college football playoff? And obviously, I'm going to start uh, with with the team up north and uh, what you think about them. Pretty pretty nice win for them yesterday, 45-7 over Nebraska, who still sucks. Uh, but do you think you know Michigan, who was ranked number two going into yesterday? Uh, you know, are they are they overrated or underrated at this point? I'd like to add a third category and say they're rated. Right where I, they're I, supposed to be? I think they're right where they're supposed to be. I think they're a little high because they really haven't shown anything. But at the same time, do they have to show anything? Their schedule's been pretty pedestrian, to say the least. Yeah, Georgia and Michigan have about the two easiest schedules that I've ever seen. Let's go through it real quick. East Carolina, UNLV, Bowling Green, Rutgers, Nebraska. That's who we've got so far. And the next three are Minnesota, Indiana, Michigan State, and then Purdue. So, you know, I, I fully expect them to be undefeated going into Penn State, don't you? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So let's move on from them because I hate talking about them. Uh, let's go to that team we just mentioned, Penn State. Uh, struggled mightily in the first half against Northwestern. Everybody was ready to give uh, Penn State uh, the college football playoff bid, uh, but you know they they did struggle yesterday. Drew Aller was not quite as good as he's been. 
Um, what did you think about Penn State? Are they overrated right now? Are they underrated? Or are they where they're supposed to be? I think that they're where they're supposed to be. I think if they're going to make that college football playoff, though, their line of scrimmage play has got to get better. I mean, they, that was supposed to be one of their strengths going in this year. And you watch that West Virginia game, they just didn't seem cohesive at all. And it, they made West Virginia's defensive line, who's solid, but this offensive line for Penn State is pretty legit. And it makes me wonder what's going on there. So if they yeah. can get that, I, I could see Penn State realistically making the CFP, though. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I was thinking they might have a chance till till I watched them yesterday, and uh, they looked rough. I mean, I know they came out and played well in the second half, but that first half was, was yeah. brutal. Um, let's let's talk about a couple, two more teams that uh, nobody's really mentioning, and that is a couple of still undefeateds, and that's Mizzou. Got to be honest with you, I had no uh, no idea that Missouri would start off uh, five and zero this year. Um, where do you think they're at? They're ranked now twenty three. Uh, what do you think about them? If anybody said that uh, if there was a betting line for Missouri to be five and zero now, um, I'm guessing they're a pretty wealthy person. Yeah, because I mean, it, Missouri just either their offense looks good or their defense looks bad. Like nothing ever looked put together. And that K-State game really surprised me because they came out and punched them. Chris Kleiman led team. Who's always very disciplined in the mouth and won. Um, I, 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 I mean, they beat Vanderbilt. It's not like they've had the greatest schedule of all time, but still, you and I both know, do I think they can beat Missouri? I mean, uh, LSU. Yeah. Kentucky, I think Kentucky is where you're going to see that first uh, L, though. Yeah, well, that was another team I was going to ask you about is Kentucky. Um, what do you think about them? Because they play Georgia next week, and I, I just – I'm sorry, but I just can't buy it. I, Kentucky always starts off 6-0, and 7-0, and ranked in the top 10, and then they play Tennessee, they play Georgia, they play whoever, and they lose like four out of their last – six uh most every year so i guess i just i gotta see it to believe it what do you believe it they're not gonna make the cfp That's i'm aware not. of that but are they are they a top 10 team in your mind no okay good all right well i didn't no. think so either but uh last team fresno state another team that's five and oh uh beat beat a bad nevada team yesterday but they are five and oh uh what do you think about fresno uh, well, you know, I'm a big Jeff Tedford fan. I do. I mean, it, it, he just finds a way to win every time he comes. He coaches there. Very disciplined. It, it, it's, I mean, you look at them, them and Air Force is going to be an interesting matchup if it gets to the uh, uh, Mountain West Championship. Yeah. I agree. So. Interesting. Uh, they, this guy has won a lot, and he's got he's doing a hell of a job recruiting right now out in Fresno as well. So yeah, um, we'll see if he can keep things going because Fresno State's had good teams in the past. Um, hopefully, they will continue uh, their run and 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 be back because I think college football is better uh, when Fresno State is good. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you uh, introduce our guest, and we're going to bring him on uh, right now and uh, uh, pop him into the mix. Well, today we're going to have Ryan Thelwell with us. Those of you who remember Ryan, the All Big Ten receiver from uh, from the University of Minnesota via Canada. And uh, Ryan, it's great to have you, my friend. What's going on, fellas? How you guys doing? Uh, we're doing good, Ryan. <laughs> I, I got to apologize up front. I had to shut the camera off. Uh, we we're out celebrating that Air Force win yesterday, and. Uh, Trying to act like I was 21 years old again. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, I, hey, you don't have to tell me. I hung him up a long time ago. I was kind of one of those guys that either had 30 or zero, and uh, I finally got to the point where it had to be zero from now on. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm with you. I am with yeah. you. But uh, pretty good pretty no. good game you guys got to see. Uh, what did you uh, what did you think about Air Force and uh, their, their team as a whole? after watching them yesterday. You know what? It was quite the experience, you know, coming, coming from Canada, you, you hear about the, the, the air force academies, the, the armies, the navies, but to actually witness it in, in, 
in uh, live and in person was absolutely amazing. The the history, the tradition, the team. And the funny part about the game is, you know, we're watching the game, and you know, before you know it, they've got forty nine points on the board, and it's like, well, where the heck did they get? Where, where did that come from? The, their their offense is so methodical. The way that the, the discipline. I know Bonnie, you you mentioned the discipline that they play with. It's absolutely amazing. And for me, and I know we've talked about this, Bonnie. I think it's something that we're going to try to to do every year to get out and watch these boys play because they're 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 quite the team. Definitely. Well, hey, Thel. One thing I, I, I you know we've talked about this, but just for our listeners' sake, what was. Yeah your process i mean coming from canada to the united states to get recruited i mean it, how what was that like from your perspective because i mean most people just think about it from people that just came from the states i mean explain that process to me of one your football journey growing up in canada and how you got yeah. to minnesota itself <clears throat> well it was, it's crazy because you know back in the mid 90s there weren't a lot of canadians that were going down so for me, and I was I was a basketball guy. Um, I, that was my first love. Played basketball at a very high level, like I was playing on the Ontario provincial team. And to put it, you know, for, for you guys, that would be playing for a state team. Um, the Ontario provincial team. We would travel, play play in other provinces. So we ended up going down to the Empire State Games in New York, which really opened up my eyes. It's just just showed me that I was a good player, but I just wasn't at that level. And so <laughs> got back. I hadn't played football up to that point. Um, really? You know, like my, a bunch of, yeah, this is my last year, my, going into my last year in high school and a bunch of my buddies played. And the, the crazy thing is that we we had a good high school football team. We, we could play with teams. We would actually go down to Pennsylvania and play teams and, and win. Wow. Um, we had gone seven years without losing a game. Like, scoring 70 points on teams. So, you know, I, you know, I decided, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. All my boys were playing the football players seemed to get all the ladies. So I figured why not, you know, I, I do it. And so started, started playing our, our coaches um, would go down to football clinics every year. Um, one of the clinics that they would go to was uh, TCU. Yeah. And this was when Jim Wacker and his crew were there. And so they built a relationship with the staff just going down every year. And, you know, uh, I still remember the day, uh, uh, probably six or seven day games in, my coach saying, hey, like, you're pretty good football player. Like, you could play. If you really applied yourself, you could, you could probably play at another level. I never believed it, but it's, it's funny how things work. I, I remember um, the first coach, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, he was with Eastern, or Il Eastern Illinois. And he had come into to London, Ontario to see me and not, I wasn't playing, was just, he wanted to meet me. So I remember going into my coach's office and there's this coach and he gives me the once over and he says to me, and I wasn't that big, like I was tall, I was 6'1", but I was probably 170 pounds. So he goes, I, I've seen bigger wings on a bucket of chicken. I, I, I remember that like it was yesterday. And I was, I was, I was so bothered because this guy who had never seen me play, he's judging me based on my physical appearance. And I remember driving home with my brother that like after meeting this guy and I, and it was just one of those, like I'll show him. Yeah. And then that's when I started to actually taking it serious. And I remember Min Minnesota coming to, it was our semi semifinal uh, game. Noel Mazzoni came out to watch me play. Um, the next morning I get a call from my coach. Hey, come on in. Minnesota wants to uh, to uh, give you a scholarship, and nice. for me, yeah, it was pretty cool. Like, and for me again, like Canadian kid, we 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 were hockey, right? We didn't yeah. get much much college football. We we did get a lot of Michigan games growing up in in London, Ontario, <gasps> but y y yeah, you just it's one thing to to actually watch it on TV, but going down there, it was just it was it was an eye opener to say the least. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about. You know, you 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 switch over to football. You you know you get some exposure. Uh, you start to play well. You get an offer. You pick Minnesota, and then you get yeah. down there and you start yeah. playing and you start going to some of these Big Ten stadiums where there's ninety hundred thousand people, uh, you know, <laughs> screaming and carrying on and going nuts. 
what what was your thoughts and what was it like for you uh, to get entrenched in in Big Ten football and see what it was like in the United States going from going from stadium to stadium? It was an eye opener. It, uh, we went from in high school, like it's because it's not like you're we're playing in Texas. This is London, Ontario. We might have 300, 400 people at, at, at a game. Like I, for example, I remember my first game at the University of Minnesota. It was uh, Penn State, yeah. and uh, um, I, they were one of the top. They ended up, I think, they were co-national champs that year. But we had sixty thousand people at the Metro Dome, and I could not just, I couldn't get over the fact that I was sitting across from. Wow, look, that's Joe Paterno and everything that came along with Penn State, and it was pretty cool. Like I remember a game uh, we were at uh, Ohio State. It was my first time playing there, and. I, I I was so enthralled with what was going on in the stands that I didn't realize that there was a sudden change of a turnover and the offense was on the field. And I'm just, I'm looking around like a kid in a candy store and the coaches come, come over yelling at me, like, what are you doing? I, we got a penalty. <laughs> or they have to call a timeout because we're one guy short. And yeah, so I got in, I got in shit about that, but it was, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Like I, I wasn't used to, like going to a Madison and getting a police escort or going to a Bonnie, remember we were talking about Northeast Louisiana yes. yesterday going down there and the, the, we were treated like rock stars. And so for a kid from London, Ontario being thrown into this environment, there are certain things that you remember about your time coming up. I'm an old man now. I'm 50. I can't, I can't tell you about a lot of the games I played in, but I do remember a lot of the experiences uh, that that uh, we had at some some stadiums, so it was pretty cool. Yeah. Who you know after uh, like who, where was the toughest place you think you played at? Oh wow, J uh, just college ball? Well, heck, I mean, throw CFL and NFL in there too as well. I mean, because let's be honest, that's I mean, there's some stadiums in the NFL that you know are kind of you know, chaotic too, as well. I mean, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts going through that? You got, if I was to say NCAA, I would say, uh, playing at the university of Wisconsin, it, it kind of felt like the fans are right up on you yeah. and, and just loud and the, the F bombs and the stuff being the, the verbal words being thrown at you. It's, it's quite the, quite the experience. And again, like they're they're loud, they're 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 boisterous, and it's just one of those stadiums that you really, really have to have your game together to to to, to win in. And you know, that's something that I didn't get a chance to do. I know the Gophers did it after I left, but it, that was a tough place to play. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, no doubt. And yeah, and, you know, obviously you uh, you know you went on to to play professionally, and you you know you said you hadn't played football a whole lot till you yeah. uh, you know got later on in your high school years, and then into college. Yeah. Um, talk to some of our listeners a little bit about you know the Canadian League. You know, you had a lot of success there. Played in the Canadian Football League for a long time. Won three Grey Cups. Tell tell some of our listeners what um, you know the Canadian Football League is like, and what kind of passion. Uh, the fans have for it up there. Oh my goodness! If you've never had a chance to attend a a CFL game, I, I'm, even watch it, watch it's it's the one thing about the league. We're talking about tradition and and pageantry of the of say Air Force. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know the CFL is probably one of the oldest sports leagues in North America. Like that, the Grey Cup has been around for over a hundred and ten years. Yep. So there's a, there's a ton of history behind it, and, and it's Canadians are proud of their league. So for me, growing up in Canada and having a chance to to play in the league, it was absolutely amazing. Um, you get to see places, for example, Saskatchewan. We we talk about uh, we were talking about this yesterday, Goldie. Their their fans are rabid. I don't think that. I can go anywhere. I, I'm sure I'm, I, I'm sure I saw Riders jersey at the Air Force game yesterday. That's how passionate their fans are. We go to Vegas, we see Riders Rider jerseys. Oh, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we oh, got you. Yeah, we got, oh, okay. you. Yeah, got me. Sorry about that. So yeah, it's just there, there's so much and and having an opportunity to to play in four Grey Cups, win three. There's there's not a lot of people that can say that they've had that that opportunity. So for me, that means a lot. I yeah. loved I love the CFL. I I try to push it. I try to sell it. I try to tell people, watch. 
the 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 play like there are a lot of great CFL players that that go down to the NFL. I don't oh, think yeah. people people realize it, and so it's uh, I don't know. I I'm a little biased, guys. You know, I'm as a Canadian boy, I I, I love it. I I'm proud to be a part of it, and uh, yeah, it's just one of those that I was blessed to 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 do. How big a struggle was that to go from? I mean, because the rule changes are just slight. Yeah. To to make that transition from you know American rules to the Canadian the CFL rules. It wasn't that tough tough for me. I I think just growing up and watching the game, I always knew everything about it. Um, the game is a little bit quicker. You know, as, yeah. as, as your fans, they might not know the field is wider, the um, and longer. The end zones are 20, 20 yards, not ten. And so uh, the, the play clock's only 20. So you've got to be in really good shape to, to play that game. And so for me, the one thing that I noticed was my weight. I was a little bit heavier coming out of the NFL. But once I came down and got settled in, my I dropped about 10 pounds. Um, it just – it was just second nature to me. Yeah. And, yeah. and Ryan, you obviously – you know, you're from Canada, so you know yes. you, you probably felt a little bit more at home than some of these guys. Tell, well, tell us a little bit what it's like for some of these dudes that are you know from America and never have been to Canada, and then all of a sudden you know they get released from the NFL, they get an offer, uh, they go up to Canada and, and want to play. Um, yep. You know, there's been a bunch of guys like that, Vernon Adams Jr. Uh, yep. from Oregon, and and Braylon Addison, another guy that I think about, and Troy Smith, uh, a, a guy I know from Ohio State who went up there and played for a little bit. Um, just talk to us a little about what it's like for them. Uh, if they've never been up there, never really played or, or watched Canadian football, and then all of a sudden they find themselves up there. What's life like for them? You know what? It's a bit, it's a learning. There's a bit of a learning experience. Um, if you've never been up, if you've never played the game, there's an extra guy that you've got to account for. So there are little, just, in, like, just little bits and pieces that um, if you're not familiar with it, like for example, there's a five yard, every punt is returned and you got to give them a five yard halo. So every year, every training camp, we know that there's going to be an American guy that comes in that will just skirt that rule and, and hit a guy. And that's a 15 yard penalty. So it's just small, small bits and pieces. I feel like there are a lot of guys that, that come up and they think that it's a Bush league and it's going to be a cakewalk. And they learn yeah. pretty quickly that there are guys up here that can play. Yeah. Um, all the American guys that come up have all pretty much spent time in the NFL, right? So it's not not like like you're, you're gonna you're gonna show up and just dominate. Like I remember when uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Ricky Williams, yeah, took a bit yep. of sabbatical and he came up. He got his butt handed to him. Mm -hmm. Guys, guys, they, they uh, everybody thought he was gonna come in and he's gonna run like, just run shot over the league and and he struggled. And I think he actually went back to the NFL after his uh, expen uh, um, uh, after he was reinstated, and he was one of the top running backs in the NFL. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it's just a different game. And we well, want I mean, to get used to it. Raheem Ismail. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as ballyhooed yeah. as he was coming out, and I mean, <sighs> he's fast, but I mean, he, yeah. his game really didn't fit the. Um, the, the 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 CFL style now you know one it, and it seems like this one always gets like you're talking about the halo rule yeah. how you you're, there's no downing it in the end zone on kicks and punts you got to take it out and yeah. how cause, I mean that's like once a year you see that on ESPN now um, and people are now understanding what the rouge is so yeah yeah it's it's interesting like just certain things the, if, so if you're not familiar with the Grey Cup again it's been around for over over 100 years. The Grey Cup actually says, if you were to read it, it says Canadian Rugby Championship. Wow. And so the game was based that. off of rugby. Yeah. So hence the footballs are a bit bigger and the rouge, that's where the rouge comes from. So again, that just speaks to the history of the game. But yeah, it's, it's, it, to me, it's such a unique game. You look at what Oregon or a lot of these, these, and I think Troy Aikman might have referred to it last week. A lot of these, teams like the Oregons and uh, and those teams that run the read option like that's that we've been doing that in the CFL for over 50 it's nothing new yeah. for us right it's it's just a variation of the CFL game so we get a little chuckle about it when uh, you know an Oregon was making it uh, the new fad and we're like hey guys we've been doing this thing forever so <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny for us yeah 
Yeah. Hey, uh, Ryan, I want to ask you, uh, going back to, to college football, I don't know how yes. much you pay attention to college football now in, in the United States, but it's changed a lot. Yep. And, um, you know, the last few years, you know, they've made it where you can you can transfer around and you can go to different schools and uh, there's no no sitting out anymore and you can get paid and, and get money. Uh, just want to know your thoughts on, uh, you know, how 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 college football has changed and, and what you think about the, the new rules or lack thereof. Do you know what? It's it's crazy to me. We were actually chatting about it um, yesterday. You know, it's, it's, I don't know if it's, I feel like it's, it's, it's good for the game as, as a, as a university player, when, you know, back in the day when I was playing, we had some tough times. Like there were days where we were going, where we didn't, we didn't eat and we didn't know where our, it, it sounds silly. I know there were uh, meal halls and stuff like that, but these kids today, I was we're watching the Buffalo game yesterday and these kids are standing on the sidelines with the gold chains, the glasses, it's, mm -hmm. it's business. I just think that it's going to create more disparity. The the rich are going to get richer because they've got the money behind them. And then the poor are going to get poor. And, and kids are going to be choosing schools based on the amount of money that they can make. And, you know, I just, there's something to be said about sticking with one team. Um, yeah. you, you see kids that are, are on their third, fourth teams, right? So it gets, it gets tougher and tougher for the fan base to, to actually get to, to know, know the, the play, to know the guys yeah. when they're jumping around. So, to me, it remains to be remains to be seen. I, I'm I'm happy for the players because they are making money, but at the same time, I kind of feel like it's just going to grow that gap um, between the the top teams and the the mid teams and the lower teams. So we'll we'll it remains to be seen. That's just my, my thoughts on it. Yeah. it. You know, you've it, just thinking about through your entire career because it's kind of just hit me in the head that Kevin Sumlin was your position coach at the U. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously he's gone to be head coach in multiple places and, you know, through your pro career and see, you know, in NFL and CFL, who was the, the one coach or player or person that I think really got through to you and kind of helped motivate you? And what was that information they gave to you? You know what? I've one thing about playing as long as I've played, I've had a lot of great coaches. I've got to, I've got to say it's got to be Wally Buono. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Wally, but Wally is a CFL coaching legend. Um, the Rock, Dwayne Johnson, speaks about how Wally changed his career, and he was just that guy. Um, Wally, when uh, when Wally uh, moved to BC in 2003, the BC Lions, he took over as head coach, and we were struggling. We were struggling, and it was, we call it the Wally effect. You know, as soon as we signed him, season tickets doubled, and I just remember he was just one of those guys where he was a straight shooter. He told you like it was, and I prefer a coach like that. Like I'd been, I'd, I'd played in places where coaches would be like, man, Ryan, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. And then you're cut the next day. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. with Wally, you knew where you stood and I respected that. Um, and he's just one of those guys that, you know, if you did what you're supposed to do and, and it, he was a player's guy. You do what you're supposed to do. You do your job. And I remember him once saying, this was, this was uh, training camp was about to kick off and uh, it was our very first meeting. And Wally comes in and he says, hey guys, like you veterans, like my, my job is to, because he was a GM as well. My job is to replace you guys. Just so you know, I'm constantly trying to replace you. And your job is to, to, not, to, to not let me do it. And I, I've, I've always remembered that. He's constantly trying to replace you trying to find better people and it just 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 makes you understand where where he's coming from from his perspective but you know where you stand right and i've uh, just i love that guy we still talk to this day so he's an amazing man yeah no i i i think it's uh good i think kids uh especially younger kids appreciate uh the honesty and yep. appreciate you know hearing uh where they're where they're at i know i would and I did when I played. I wanted to know, yeah. you know where where I was and what I was doing. But uh, you know, just one more uh, facet about the the college football thing. Um, you know, we're obviously a college football show here, and and things yes. are changing even more. Uh, yeah. They're they're doing. You know, they're basically the Pac-12, which I've always loved uh, watching the Pac-12. That conference is now gone uh, yeah. after this year, and and all these teams. You know, you played in the Big Ten. 
you uh, had a hell of a career at Minnesota catching balls out there. And and now the Big Ten is going to be a, a, a super conference. And I yeah. uh, just want to get your thoughts on, you know, you talked about going to Ohio State and going to Wisconsin and going to Penn State and all those places. Well, now these kids yep. are going to go to L.A. and play UCLA and they're going to go to the Coliseum and yeah, play USC. You know That's just kind of crazy, isn't it? It is. And I'm a tradition traditionalist. And I, I love the old Big Ten. And even now when I watch – you know, Rutgers and, you know, Maryland. And I'm glad, don't get me wrong, it's great, but I'm just not used to it. And so yeah. uh, it, it's just one of those things where it's, uh, I know the game's changing. It's good for the game. It's all about the money. Um, I'm a bit of, uh, I'm old school. I kind of like the, the old way of, of how it was done. And so, so for me, you know, I'm not a big fan of it, but again, it's, it's progress. It's going it to constantly change. It's, just something that we expect. So, yeah. Hey, Ryan, when you came to Minnesota, did you ever think a bell, an axe, a jug, or a pig <laughs> would need as much fuse as it does now? Never. <laughs> I remember going into these games like, what are these guys talking about? A pig? What? But yeah, it, that, again, it's something to be said about history and, and tradition. And now when I, I watch these games and my buddies from Canada, they're looking at it like, what, what, what is this? It's ridiculous. But yeah, that's just it. Again, for me, that's just a part of it, and I, I love it. I, I try to get as much as the terms. Of, even I think Wisconsin, Wisconsin games. That's that's my thing. If I can catch a Wisconsin game, that that's it. But that that, that tradition, that history, man, we we don't get that up here, and it's something that we love. So. Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, that's what that's what we were just talking about earlier. We love. Uh, you know, the passion that people have for college football, me and James have both loved it for our whole lives. And, you know, it's just something that uh, people really get excited about. They build their yeah. weekends around it in the fall. And, uh, you know, just to see, you know, I went to a game a couple of years ago where I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now I'm a Buckeye fan, but I live in Tennessee yeah. now. And uh, Tennessee played Virginia Tech at Bristol, which yeah. is a, uh, you know, a car, a NASCAR race track. And they had 180,000 wow. people there. And I got to tell you, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. So, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we, we all love this game, but I think the, you know, the pageantry of it is, is kind of what I like. I, it, you know, the NFL is cool. It's fun to watch yeah. games on TV, but going uh, to a college football game, I think, is what separates it, don't you? I agree, and it's, it's crazy. I got to give your guy credit here, Bonnie. We, we've, we, well, obviously, we've been spending the weekend here and, and, you know, taking in the sights here at Colorado Springs, and he knows his football. <laughs> he does. He does. Know, I don't think I've ever met somebody that knows so much about college football. We are going through, we're talking about games just random. And he's, he's talking about players from these teams that uh, we, I don't even know half of these teams. So I, I, Bonnie, I got to give you credit, brother. You, you know, your stuff. Yeah, you know, no, I love it. Yeah, we used to have him on this show, and I'm like, hell, he knows more than the the, oh, guy, the no. host that I have. I was like, let's get that guy out of here. We got to get him uh, to replace him. I was like, he knows more than anybody. So, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Ryan, thank you so much, man, for uh, for coming on with us today. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing, oh, man. Uh, hearing from you and, and getting a chance to to meet with you. No, thank you, guys. I tr I truly appreciate it. And, uh, Bonnie, man, thank you, brother. That what, taking in that game with you made my experience a lot better. So I appreciate it, and thank you for having me. Hey, All right, man. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Good luck. Talk to you soon. Now, All right, man. Well, well we talk got... about his basketball prowess. <clears throat> he was on our intramural basketball team. Man, he was so good. Holy crap! Like when he talked about that before, I mean, it was amazing how good he was. Yeah, I uh, I remember him um, from back in the day, but I I you know time you, time goes by and your your memories all get jarbled. So I went back and looked and and watched, found some film and and read up. You know, I mean, this guy had a storied career at, at Minnesota and had over uh, almost twenty three hundred yards receiving, over sixteen touchdowns, and. Um, really, really made his mark uh, to the point where a lot of Gopher fans and, and Big Ten faithful uh, remember this dude and then went on to have a very successful uh, career, you know, in the NFL and also um, the Canadian League. So I'm glad we uh, got a chance to, to bring him back out and um, introduce him to some people that may not uh, may not have been around at that time because absolutely uh, was, dude was a baller. 
Well, I mean, heck, I go back to the Penn State game um, in 19 where uh, uh, Bateman had the, that big yardage game. Well, he, he was very close to breaking Ryan's all-time single-game record. I mean, That's Crawford was with me for the game, and every time he got closer, we both kept looking at that stat like, we wanted Ryan to keep that record. So, yeah, right. and he still has it, right? Yeah, still has yeah. it. Still has yeah. it. Um, what was what was the numbers? I'm trying to remember. I saw that um, he I saw had. That. I think it was like 14. It was 14 for 222. 222. Uh, I think. Right. I know it was over right. 200. Yeah, and and you know they the the U as you call it is known kind of for their running backs, but they've had some sneaky. Uh, good uh, wide receivers throughout the years, as me and you talked about, you know, Ron Johnson and Tyler, um, you know, more, more recently Tyler. And then, um, uh, you know, Eric Decker, who who went on to have a, a fabulous uh, career. That guy was also a, a baller of a baseball player, too, if I remember correctly. He was. Um, he was. So they well, had good wide know, outs. Ryan's other receiver on his team uh, was Tutu Atwell, who you yes. may know his son, L.A. Ram, Tutu Atwell. Yes. Um, yeah. Corey Sauter was their quarterback. Um, people probably forget the name Chris Darkins, who was an amazing running back. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, just awesome to uh, we try and, you know, break down all the uh, current uh, college football action and uh, give our takes on that. But I also like to talk about the history yeah. Of college football and we we really try and do that on this show where we, we we mix in a little bit of both where we uh you know talk about um the future we talk about uh the current state and then we uh try and sprinkle in we're so old now james that you know we've got uh all these archives in our memory that you know some of these young kids they don't know anything about so it's our job i feel like to uh to let them know well i mean hell we were sitting there talking about the cfl i mean most people don't even remember Warren freaking Moon. Yeah. And, I mean. Doug Flutie, like, Warren Moon. I mean, uh, Cameron yeah. Wake. There's been a lot of guys that that cut their teeth in the CFL um, or, you know, started in the NFL and then went to the CFL and had had storied careers. So, yeah. it, goes both, it goes both ways. Absolutely. So, which games, uh, going back to the current, which games next week? are really sticking out to you for, for week six. You know, we got Oklahoma, Texas, obviously, um, you know, LSU, Missouri. Some people are talking about, um, you know, Alabama, Texas A&M. Which games to you are, are really sticking out? You know, I mean, besides the obvious ones, um, Alabama and m you know, I, I, I think if a and is going to be for real, that's got to be the game – that they got a circle on their calendar and you know Jimbo's had success against Saban so yeah. it's not out of the realm of possibility I personally like the Washington State at UCLA game yeah. um I I, I the, the the Pac-12 is just my fear is that everybody's going to beat everybody and nobody gets into the freaking playoff which would be yeah. a shame for that conference um yeah, yeah I, I those two games really kind of uh, started off for me because there's a lot of games. There's like possible, you know, things that could happen, but all depends on injuries too, as well. Has game day been announced yet at all or not? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't watch that crap anymore. Um, big noon kickoff for Fox is going to be in Columbus, uh, for the Maryland Ohio state game. And I got to tell you that game is going to be a, a closer, um, tougher contest than people think. Maryland is a team that is is another one that's five and zero and gets no credit. Um, they get no love. They get no publicity. No one speaks about them. But they've got a quarterback who's thrown for almost fifteen hundred yards in five games. He's got thirteen touchdowns, three interceptions. Uh -huh. He's played a lot of football. Um, this kid is, is for real, and the the Maryland offense is for real, in my opinion. I, I agree. I mean, Talia is plays a lot like his brother. And I, I think he doesn't get near the pub he should because he plays at Maryland. If he was at, at Alabama, we'd be probably having the first round conversation, but he's got first round abilities. Yeah, I agree. I, I can see this guy being an NFL quarterback uh, easily. I mean, think about how much better, excuse me, Maryland would well, I, 
think he was in the middle of a thought there, but uh, I cannot yeah. hear you, Bunny. Bunny, I lost you there for a second, buddy. Um, but I, I, I do think that's going to be a really good game, uh, Maryland and Ohio State. And then another one that I think bodes uh, watching is the Kentucky and Georgia game. You know, every year we talked about, uh, you know, Kentucky – comes out of the gate strong and then they get into the meat of their schedule and they fall apart a little bit, but uh, that's another one. But James, we, are you, you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. I got okay, you. I well, got you. Finish, finish your thought, please. Uh, I don't even remember where I was at. Must not been that important, but honestly, I think a lot of these teams, <laughs> man, I'm, I'm just happy to be awake right now. I'm tired, man. This has been a long week. Oh, if anybody ever gets a chance, you got to see the opening pageantry at an Air Force game. Watching the cadets go down the the, the tunnel to go out to the field. Uh, both locker rooms go through that. The last thing you, you see is the sign about how you're entering over 7,000 feet above sea level. I mean, you can feel it. I mean, the, yeah. the, the air's a little uh, lighter up here. No, that's why I was talking to Ryan about it. Um, I was somebody posted a video th uh, today about you know the Virginia Tech uh, entrance and enter Sandman. I mean, Virginia Tech's been down. Let's be honest, pretty much yeah. since Frank Beamer left. But their fans are still crazy. You know, the, the here where I live now, uh, the running through the T. You know, I mean, um, there's just so much tradition and uh, pageantry of college football. It's you know, it's more than just a game. It's um, you know, it's it's really important to these people. Um, I was going on my walk last night at like uh, 1230, almost one in the morning, and they were still doing the postgame show uh, here on the local fan run radio uh, about the Tennessee South Carolina game. And, and they were still talking about the game. I'm like, the game's been over for five, you know, four hours, three hours, and they're, they're still breaking it down because uh, these people care so much. So, um, you know, brutal injury also for the balls yesterday, Brew McCoy. Uh, broke his ankle on a, a just a disgusting uh, play, and I, I feel bad for that kid because he has uh, really, really uh, put together a solid career since he got in, got here to Knoxville from transferring from USC. And um, you know, I, I wish the best for him. Uh, South Carolina is just a horrible football team. Um, I feel yeah. bad for Spencer Rattler, man. I mean, they've got some good pieces. They've got a really good uh, wide receiver in. Um, uh, what's his name? Xavier Leggett. Leggett. Um, and they've got a really good running back in Mario Anderson and a pretty damn good quarterback in Spencer Rattler. And then the uh, then you look at their offensive line and it, it's just a disaster. Uh, I think they had six sacks last night and um, at least eight or ten tackles for loss. I mean, it, it was just a, a dumpster fire. Um, for the Gamecocks, so I, I, I'm not sure where to go, where they're going from here. But Tennessee, to me, uh, played a pretty good game, and uh, I'm interested to see. I'm going to be at the game next week live uh, for the Texas A&M Tennessee game. Uh, well, actually, actually, that's the week after the 14th of October, so I'll get a chance to see uh, Jimbo and also uh, see the balls in person. So it should be interesting. Great. All right, boss. Well, keep it up. Go get some rest. Yeah. And uh, go drink some water and um, make sure you uh, recoup yourself because uh, we're going to need you. We got we got a bunch more. We got a bunch more games to get through here. Well, we got to get through Red River, man. I mean, that's going to be the last Red River in the Big 12 before their SEC teams. Yeah, I hope they keep playing every year. That's yeah. one thing that I, I really do. Um, you know, they, they, you can change college football. That's fine. But let's keep some of the tradition, too. I mean, these teams are still in the same conference. They can keep playing. Um, you know, I think uh, you know a lot of the Big Ten uh, traditions are going to continue. And then also there'll be new ones added. I mean, Ohio State's got a really good history playing USC. And so does Penn State and some of the other teams. So now they can, you know, play them even more. And I think that's cool. Um, but I do want to keep uh, – I, I want to keep that Red River, River rivalry, if you say that five times fast, uh, keep that going because I, I always love watching that game. Uh, they, they, it just seems to mean a little bit more for those kids, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, bud. Uh, keep your chin up. And um, great uh, show today. I love breaking it down. Uh, great guest having a former Big Ten wide receiver and uh, three-time Grey Cup champion from the CFL uh, with Ryan coming and joining us. So uh, go check it out. Go to our uh, 
YouTube page if you missed any of the other shows. We've had some ballers on the last few weeks and uh, man coverage 2075. Type it in and you've got access to all those. James, uh, thanks for your time and keep your chin up. Uh, go get some rest, buddy. Thank you much. We'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good, bud. Later.